Hello everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to this um, IRMS Legal October event. So we have just gone live. Uh, so what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to give a, a couple of minutes for people to join and then we'll make a start. So um, chat bar is open, so please do say hello, maybe where you're coming from today. Uh, what the weather's like. I'm in Bedfordshire and it's pouring it down. It has been all morning. It's very dark. Yes. I'm, hoping gets, I'm hoping it gets a bit better maybe as the day goes on. <laughs> I'm up in Yorkshire and it's very wet here too. So. Seems like it might be the whole country or quite a lot of it. Yeah, it looks. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> oh, sunny Scotland. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Right. Sorry. Caught the first. <laughs> we got excited then. We were all on our way to Scotland. Hi everyone. So yeah, I'm just going to give it another minute. So if you're just joining, welcome. We'll get started in a minute or so. But yeah, please do post hi in the chat. Yeah, very wet, very rainy. Oh dear. They're very autumnal. On the bright side, we're indoors. Yes, so, that is. You know. <laughs> I think it, oh. Oh, Australia. Okay. okay. Hey. I hope it's not raining in Australia. <laughs> or do I? I don't know. Okay, so as we're a couple of minutes past 12, what I'll do is I'll just kind of make a start. Um, so hello everyone, thank you so much for joining. Um, this is the IRMS Legals October events. Um, I'll obviously, I haven't, I'm not Iram, um, my name's Emma, I'm the London Group Chair. So Iram uh, sends her apologies, but she is working in another time zone actually. So I am covering for her today, uh, just hosting this event. Um, Oh, it's raining also in Australia. Oh, bless. Um, so uh, without much further ado, I will hand over to our, our speaker today, uh, Sarah, who's very kindly um, going to speak to us about Teams and Microsoft 365. Uh, please do um, continue to post in the chat. Uh, post, uh, there's a questions tab as well. Across the bottom of your see screen, you'll see it. It's a little tab of questions. So please do pop your questions in there as well. We'll keep an eye on them as, as the uh, talk goes on. But um, if that's all right, I'll hand over to you, Sarah, to, to start the talk. Thank you very much. Um, so I, as uh, Emma said, I will be looking at the questions tab as we go through. So if you do have questions, please do post them as we go along. I'll try and answer questions as we go along if they're relevant to what we're talking about or pick them up at the end if we've missed any. So today we're talking about sensitivity labels. And we're going to try and help prevent the wild west of Microsoft Teams. So um, my name is Sarah Fenner. I'm a Microsoft 365 trainer. I'm also a Microsoft MVP, which apparently means I know what I'm talking about. Um, and I like to talk about it. So um, both tie in very nicely. If you want to know any more about my career and background, please do look me up on social media. Alternatively, don't. And we'll move on with the content because um, that's what you're here for. Now, I'm not trying to make you all hungry. I know it's lunchtime. It's not that kind of takeaway that I'm talking about. But just to let you know that the we will be sharing notes after the session. So links that I mention will be in those notes that will be sent out to you after the session if you registered. So this is actually the third session that we've done in this series, and we've been looking at using Microsoft 365 for a number of, number of different reasons. So particularly today, we're going to focus on governing information. Okay, so um, 
when we talk about the wild west of Microsoft Teams, we're talking about uncontrolled teams and channel creation and the impact of external sharing. Now, Teams is a very, very valuable and very powerful collaboration tool, but it has been designed to be used by users with minimal IT controls. And in some organizations that can be a challenge. And it, a lot of people's, you know, took the digital transformation via the COVID methodology, which is switch on and pray. And that does open up a can of worms. All of these um, rather um, English acronym, you know, uh, analogies here that I'm using, but basically that teams uncontrolled can get very messy very quickly. So how do we bring some of this control without restricting the unique nature of teams, without restricting that collaboration? So one of the options is that we can restrict the creation of Microsoft Teams. Okay. And the way we do this is we put limitations on who can create Microsoft 365 groups. Microsoft 365 groups is the technology that powers Microsoft Teams. And we can limit this to particular um, individuals within our organization or groups so that they are the ones that have permission. And this has the advantage of reducing the team's sprawl and giving us oversight of what teams are being created and also approval before they're created. It doesn't, however, limit external sharing. So if we allow external sharing from teams, then we allow external sharing from every team. Restricting who can create teams doesn't solve that problem. And if we switch it off, it's off everywhere. Again, not ideal. We want more granular control there, ideally. The other thing is, if we restrict the creation of Microsoft Teams, then it has an impact on other Microsoft 365 services that also use the Microsoft 365 Groups technology. So users can't create new Power BI workspaces. They can't create SharePoint sites. They can't create Yammer communities. They can't create planner groups or project for the or new projects in Project for the Web. So restricting the creation of Microsoft 365 groups has a bigger knock-on impact than just restricting who can create Teams. You also need to have a premium AD license. Now, premium means a Microsoft 365 plan. So Microsoft 365 Business Premium, Microsoft 365 E3, Microsoft 365 E5, or Azure AD Premium Add-on. Premium one or premium two, it doesn't matter which, it's in both, okay? What doesn't include this functionality is the Office 365 plans and the Microsoft 365 Business Basic and Business Standard. If you're working in the academics sphere, then Premium AD is included in all of the academic licenses. To restrict who can create Teams, an administrator needs to run a PowerShell script. It needs to be a global administrator to run this, you need the top level privileges, um, and then you can restrict who can create teams. If that's something that your organization needs to explore, there is a link as to how to do that in the handout, <coughs> excuse me, to accompany this session. However, one thing to consider, if you're going to restrict who can create teams, you need to deploy some form of automation around the creation of Teams or a business process. How, if I can't create a team, how do I get a team when I need it? If I can't create 
a Power BI workspace, a SharePoint site, a project in project for the web, etc. How do I how do I request it? How do I get one? Now there are a number of different templates out there on the internet. Microsoft have published their own that you can use with Power Apps. It's available from GitHub. And again, I've included the link in the handout that will be sent out afterwards. And there's third party products as well that deal with um, a request approval and generation process. And they automate the creation of the teams. So if you are going to lock that down, then those are things that you need to consider. However, I'm going to think about something slightly different. What about if you leave it open? How about allowing users to create teams, but let's limit the, the teams they can create? So what I want, what I'm thinking here is that we allow users to create a team, but we control whether that team can have external users on it or not. We control the public private setting on a team and a Microsoft 365 group to ensure that users don't accidentally create teams that are open and sharing information across the whole organization. So it's giving us those kind of controls. And um, to do this, I'm going to use sensitivity labels. And sensitivity labels are one of the least well understand, understood mechanisms that we can use to control the Wild West, yet still give us the flexibility and leave a lot of things open for users to self-manage in a protected way. We can use sensitivity labels to classify content. So apply it to a file, to an email, or we can use it to classify containers, teams, SharePoint sites, Power BI workspaces, etc. If we use it to classify content, then we can restrict access to that content. So we can limit it to internal users only. We can limit it to certain groups within our internal users. And we can also restrict the actions within that content. Can we print? Can we copy? I am talking about all sorts of different content we store in Teams, as well as emails that we send out yeah, and um, the Power BI reports that we build, the data that those rely on, we can limit that access to that content in that way. You can also put headers and footers and watermarks on content to remind people of how to handle it. And the other big advantage of this is it travels with the content. So the permissions, the restrictions here are not coming from the container that the file is stored in. So if we move the file, the protections still apply to the file. We no longer keep our data behind these tidy firewalls. Information is collaborated on, it's shared, and, and therefore we need this security of the information wherever it's stored. And the big advantage with the sensitivity labels model is we can also use it to restrict the features on the containers as well as restrict the content. So I can apply a sensitivity label to a team and lock it so that only internal people can join that team. And we can have other teams that allow externals, but this team is lim limited. And the label can be changed over time. So you think about that top secret project, we start with it as top secret, the team, no one can access the conversations. Then we bring in a limited group of people. Then we open it up to the company and ultimately we might open it up externally as well. So 
we've got that flexibility. Labels can be applied manually. That's the most common way of doing it. So when we create a team, we apply a label. When we create a file, we apply a sensitivity label. We can also automatically label content that does require the E5 license. And with E5, we can also integrate with security tools like Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps um, to help protect content once it's left our tenant and recover content in that way. Okay. We can also set a default label on the container, the folder that we're putting the files into, the library to be more precise to use the technical term, and that will pick up the default label. That's also an E3 feature that doesn't require the E5 license. That's a standard in most products. Yeah, business premium, business standard as well. When we're working with sensitivity labels, we need to create them before our users can assign them to things. Okay. And I'm going to walk you through how to do this. And then we'll look at how, what restrictions we have for the teams and the benefits this gives us in controlling that uncontrollable environment that we've got with Microsoft Teams. We're, when we create, we, so we first of all, we create a sensitivity label, which has the protection settings within it. Then we need to make those labels available to our users. And we use a policy. Not every user needs to have the same labels. Okay. And therefore, we can restrict some sensitivity labels to some users. So we can say, right, everyone can create a team for use internally. But only certain people have a sensitivity label that will allow them to create a team which permits external users to join. So we've got a bit more control already from that. So this pairing of creating the label and then choosing who to publish that label to with a policy gives us extra control. The other advantage of the policy is when you create the policy, you choose how those labels can be assigned. Do they have to have a label? Can they change the label on the files on the site? Okay, so we have a lot of control. So we're going to come back to this discussion. But first of all, I'm going to jump into a demo of actually creating the labels. So let me just maximize my window. So I'm here in the purview portal, which used to be called the Compliance Center. And I'm looking at information protection here on the left hand side. And this is where we work with the sensitivity labels. So to start with, I go to labels and I create a label. I'm going to create a brand new label here. Okay. And I'm going to um, create a label. I'm just going to call it a demo label. Okay. Now that name will never change. That is its technical name. Okay. But we're also going to give it a display name that the users see. And we can be a little bit more descriptive in here if we want to. It doesn't have to match. OK, and you'd obviously use that name to describe the use case of that sensitivity label. When users hover their mouse over that label, they also get the description. Oh. And it's a good idea to spell it correctly. And 
and then you can put in a different description for administrators so they understand why it was created. Your users will never see that. There's a relatively new feature as well that you can choose a different color and that color will show up when the users are applying the label and also where the label is assigned. We can help see that color scheme. So it can be useful to use different colors for different levels of protection. What you use them for is up to you. I tend to go left to right. The more protections get a color towards the right, the lower protections color towards the left. Um, <clears throat> but you might have a color coding system that you want to interpret and bring in in here. Oh, I've got an ampersand. It doesn't like, I always forget that. It doesn't like the symbols. There we go. So the next step is decide what you're going to configure in this label. And you can do them separately. So you have a label for files and a label for groups and sites, your containers, and also a label for your Azure structured data, your schematized data assets. Um, or you can do them all in one label. It's worthwhile pointing out, if I do have all of these settings in one label, it isn't automatically applied to the content within the container that the label is applied to. So if I label a team with this label, it isn't automatically applied to all of the files within the team. You can make it happen, but it doesn't happen automatically. Okay, I'm not interested in the Azure piece. At the moment, I'm gonna concentrate on the Microsoft 365 space for today, so I'm just gonna use items and groups. Okay, with regard to protecting items, files, and emails, if I want to control who can access it, I will encrypt it. And if I want to put header, footer, watermark on, I'll mark the items. So then with the encryption, I can either just remove encryption to unprotect a file, or I can configure some form of encryption settings where I can set up the settings, the permissions now, or I can let the user create the permissions as they assign them. And normally we create it for them. I'm not gonna expire anybody's access to the content. However, I am gonna say that you can only keep accessing it when you're offline for two days. After those two days, you have to authenticate and prove who you are so that I can check you should still have access to this file. Okay. The reason I've done it for, I tend to go with two days is if people are struggling with internet connection, it usually res is resolved quite quickly. Um, it doesn't mean you have to log in. It just means when you open the file, the tool that you're using to open the file has got to be able to connect to the internet to check that your login account should still have access to the um, information. And then we go and assign permissions. So I want to allow um, users in my organization to have access and I'm going to let them co-author that. I also want to allow any guests that we've got in our tenant to have read access to this information. So I'm gonna go with any authenticated users and I'm gonna drop their permissions down to reviewer. Okay. And what this means, I've now got two different sets of permissions here. So if you, if you're a user in my tenant, and I've given you a license, you can edit the document. If you're a guest, the only thing you can do with this is read it. Even if 
you're a full member of a team. Okay, you've got full access to the SharePoint site. You can't do anything but read that document. You can't edit it. And if we look at these permissions, you can actually customize these to suit. So if I go into custom, for example, I could say, right, they can print it. They can reply to it. Okay if it's an email, or I could say they can't reply. Um, and you've got all sorts of different restrictions here, you, including copy. So if you don't want them to be able to copy content out of the file, you can basically give them view and print, or just view, and nothing else. And then they can't save it elsewhere. They can't copy content from it. They can't print from it, etc. Okay, so we can customize those permissions. If you want to add your own encryption on, you can bring in double key encryption, but by default, it uses Microsoft standard encryption keys and your office tools automatically know about those encryption keys so do most other tools but they're checking permissions as well so it's a little bit simpler to use the standard encryption keys because you don't have to distribute your own it's like a coding system the tool encodes it i've got to have the the answer sheet the cheat sheet if you like to unencode it and we can build our own encryption key into that, or we can just use the standard one. The content marking allows you to put header, footer, or watermark on. These are standard size, so if you're going to be applying it to different size documents, perhaps think about that carefully. Okay, now these watermarks are only applied by the Microsoft 365 desktop applications, not by the web applications. Okay, going forward, web applications will support these, but at the moment it's only the desktop. So the, the content marking is only applied when you edit a labeled document in the desktop apps. Once the content marking is on, you can see it in the web apps, but it isn't applied if you apply the sensitivity label. OK, so please don't expect content marking to appear everywhere yet. As I say, it is rolling out. But it will take longer. OK. Um, I'm just reading a question in the chat. I think I'll come back to that. OK. We're also going to consider auto labeling here. Now this auto labeling doesn't require an E5 license, but it only applies it during the editing of the content. If you want to be able to auto label content, regardless of whether it's been stored and then labeled or labeled a long time ago or created a long time ago you need to use an auto labeling policy which does require an e5 license so generally i would say don't auto label here it's much more restrictive it's much more limited okay and then we can go on to our groups and these are the settings that apply to our team okay and what I can do here is I can protect the privacy. So a public team or group allows everybody to act, everybody in your organization to access the files. Not guests, just everyone in your organization. But they don't automatically show up as members of the team. So a public team is a little bit misleading because you think you can see everyone who has access and anyone can join a public team they don't have to be added and invited 
but actually anyone can find the content through a search. So that's actually a little bit risky. So I'm going to limit people to only creating private teams until they understand what they're doing. I am going to allow external users on this team. Am I? Actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to only allow you to create this team internally. Okay, so we can limit the creation of teams to be only um, available for internal and later have the sensitivity label changed so that we can bring in external guests if we need to. But now no one can accidentally add an external person to this team either. Because sometimes your external people show up in your address book search and you don't necessarily want them there. Um, I'm also going to control sharing. So whilst the files are stored in this team or SharePoint site, the share button will only allow me to share with people inside my organization. Now, if you move the file outside, the file itself isn't labeled. So you will be able to share it if you say move it to your OneDrive, assuming you've got different sharing settings there. Another really powerful piece is bringing in the Azure AD conditional access. So what we can do here is we can say, if you're on a device which is not one that we manage, it's not connected to the Microsoft 365 environment and managed by your organization, we can limit what you can, how you can connect to this team. So I'm going to say you can only access this team through the web tools. You can't use the desktop teams tool, so you can't synchronize either. You can if we're managing your device. If it's a company managed device, we can you can do that because we can control the updates, etc., on there. Okay. Or we can choose what we call an authentication context, which allows us to set up different rules um, on this for, um, for example, if you're connecting from a location we don't know, not just a device we don't know. So we can get much more granular with those controls using those authentication contexts. Okay. Um, at this point, I'm going to look at the questions in the chat. Um, so we've been asked about the recording. Yes, the recording is available and it will be shared um, after the webinar later. Okay. Um, so we also have another question of, is there a risk of overlapping conflicting permissions? Um, there, technically, there is a risk, okay, in terms of you might, it might get confusing. But the idea of how we do it is the SharePoint permissions grant access to the location, okay? We're using the sensitivity labels to make it easier to refine the settings for a single site, or if we apply the label to the document and we've got those document level permissions, the single document within the SharePoint site, okay, or the team, because every team file storage is powered by SharePoint. Realistically, with Teams, we're not really touching the SharePoint permissions, okay? We've got the team. You're If you're in the team, you can access all the files. So we're making it easier with these sensitivity labels to then put in place those protections. It means we don't need an administrator to go and do these settings, these sharing settings, on a site-by-site -site basis. We just pick a sensitivity label. 
we don't need to go as an administrator and start setting up all of these conditional access policies on a site by site basis. That's very time consuming. So it's putting that governance in place. If we're applying a label to a site, then ideally we're not going to get that conflict coming up because you're going to not spend time customizing permissions. And the other thing I'd like to pick up on this question is I we shouldn't really be setting permissions on folders and, and documents with SharePoint permissions. That is a very difficult situation to manage. And that's where the sensitivity labels then come in because we start using the sensitivity labels. Okay. Hopefully that helps. You do have to think about it and plan it out a little bit, but hopefully that helps you see where the the two are positioned slightly differently. And the last question we had was around um, the um, allowing people to add documents and edit them, but prevent them from deleting anything. Um, so there are ways of doing some of these things. The challenge with preventing users from deleting, it also stops users editing file names, okay? So you can't rename a file if you don't have delete permissions in SharePoint. Um, so we can't prevent deletion, we tend to go we can't prevent deletion with permissions. You can use retention labels to prevent deletion. And that would allow people to edit. And you could set a default retention label onto a SharePoint library or folder, but that requires an E5 license. Um, we've also got... Um, Upload functionality, there is what's called a drop-off library, which is classic SharePoint. That's actually been replaced with the idea of request links. Yeah, so you can, if you have a folder in a SharePoint site or in your OneDrive, you can choose a request files link for that location instead. So it doesn't really fall into this topic that we're discussing today, but there are ways of doing it. Hopefully that answers all of the questions. Excellent. So no setting for the schematized assets because I chose not to do that. And I go and create my label. Once my label's created, I can then build the policy. And the policy is just as powerful. Yeah, so I'm going to publish my label to my users. Okay, now this starts creating a policy. Let me just cancel that. If you choose not to create it immediately, you can go to label policies and publish your label and you can create your label from here and you choose which sensitivity labels you're going to publish. So I'm going to publish just this one. You choose which users you're going to publish this to. Now, Microsoft have also announced last week at Ignite that we will also be able to scope labels to particular apps too. So as well as users, I could say this one's only available in Word. Okay, so we can scope it to users and to apps going forward. I've yet to see the detail of that. It was just the announcement, so time will tell. So we can choose which users we're going with, individual users or groups. I'm going to leave it on all. And then we choose the settings. Now, this is where a lot of this power starts coming in. Let me just zoom that for you. There we go. So... When we're 
publishing these labels, we can choose to allow users to lower the classification. So the order our labels are in is important. We can choose to enforce them labeling documents and content. Okay, so if I say they've got to provide a justification and I will enforce labeling on content, then as I move forward, I can choose a default label for documents and also for emails. And we do have the option to not enforce it on emails because if I've limited it to internal only, um, you send an email with that label on. And I said my external people could only read. So I send an email externally and they can't reply. So we've got to think a little bit about how we're using it. And also with our groups, we could set that up as well. Okay. And you give it a name and you publish that. I'm not going to publish that because it clashes with some of the others I've got up at the moment. Okay, you also have the auto labeling where you can choose how you want to discover the content that it's going to be applied to. So your medical, for example, looks at content that contains health data. So, as I mentioned, these auto labeling is the E5 products, but oh, I've already done that one. Okay, then you choose where it's been applied and you can exclude groups as well. And then we have the rules, so how it's identifying those. And we can go in and customize those rules, which is very similar to creating data loss prevention policies as well, putting in exceptions for email recipients and so forth. OK. And then we can have different rules for SharePoint, different rules for OneDrive as well, with different exceptions in there choose which label you're going to apply. Oh, I'll pick one, just pick one. And then you can choose if, when you apply it, you're going to replace an, another label. Okay, so there's lots of settings in there that you can pick up. Once you've done that, we can go and assign it to our documents and also to our team. So when we're creating a team, we get this image on the right here to choose a sensitivity label. And when you change the label, it'll change the settings. With documents, as you open a file, you can change the sensitivity label. New feature coming out. We don't have to go to the sensitivity button. We can click on this file name up at the top here, and we can choose the sensitivity label as well as renaming the file to changing the location. And you can see the different colors starting to come through there as well, which is a relatively new new feature. That's relying on users manually putting the labels on individual documents. If I've labeled my team, I want all of my documents in my team to be labeled the same way. So what I'm going to do is open, go to my files tab in Teams, and I'm going to choose the open in SharePoint option, which brings me to SharePoint, surprisingly enough. From the cog, I'm going to pick up library settings, which then allows me to set this default. And now all of my documents in my team can automatically pick up that sensitivity label. This will apply to all of the standard channels. If you want to apply it in a private or a shared channel, you've got to set that separately. Okay. They pick up the sensitivity label 
of the main team. But the files are stored in a different SharePoint site. So you've got to go and set this library default separately. And the library default doesn't need to be the same as the team, but I would strongly recommend it is, otherwise people will get very, very confused. So just to take a step back, have I tamed the Wild West? Well, I probably haven't tamed everything, but what I've done with these sensitivity labels is I've limited the functionality. So I've said, okay, you can only create a private team. I'm also blocking you from adding guests. I can apply conditional access rules to control where that team can be accessed from. So we're still leaving it open, but we've really strengthened the safety net. So we still need to train our users on when to create teams. But, you know, to get total control, because I've left it open, we need to train them. But at the same time, you know, it might still be wild, but we've got controls there. We've got that restriction in place. You also noticed when I was publishing the label, I was publishing one label, but I had lots. So while everybody only gets the restricted label for the teams, I can give my trustworthy and knowledgeable uh, users more labels so they can create the more open teams. They can create public. They can create teams that allow external guests. And they can go to any team that they're an owner on and change the label on that team to any they have available. So my user might create their own team and say, can't add guests. So they put in a request to IT. We can change the label for them. And now they can have guests on their team. We don't have to create a new one. So, um, or if we have a problem with a team that's got guests on it and we need to quickly shut it down, we can change the sensitivity label that blocks all of the guests. They can't access the files, they can't access the chat, they can't access anything. They will then be removed from the team, but initially we just put that blocker in place really quickly or we can block individual files. Now, this isn't everything we can do to control teams. If you're looking at governing Microsoft Teams in full, you need to ask yourself a series of questions. So who can create teams and what do they look like? Now, that's obviously um, the controls we're going to put in it as to who can create Microsoft 365 groups. We can also bring in naming conventions. So do we want to block certain words in the names of teams? We can use um, a, team, a group naming policy for that. You can also enforce adding certain words in as well. So um, you can enforce adding team. You can enforce adding uh, the country of the user who's creating the team. They're going to lengthen the name of it, but um, those are naming conventions that you can assign. In terms of controlling the features that users can use in Teams, we've also got policies inside Microsoft Teams that we can use for limiting features. So if you don't want users to be able to record meetings um, or you've got a particular team where you don't uh, want users to be able to add tabs, then we've got controls that we can put in place either at the team level 
or per user. Guest access is either on or off or controlled by a sensitivity label. Restricting what apps you can use with Teams, again, that's a policy driven feature that we can use to really restrict it. Our data security leans into these data loss prevention policies, the sensitivity labels, and also the retention labels. And we can also set Teams to expire. So users need to confirm that they need them on a recurring basis where they're not being used. So those are the sorts of controls we can put in place. So I'm going to go to the questions that we've got. Um, let's have a look. Let's pull the question up. <clears throat> OK, so we can create a Teams group with strong sensitivity labels. Labels are applied to Teams manually only. Just pick that up. Um, and then we can modify the sensitivity label on the team to change the setting. Okay, we can't override the settings of the sensitivity label by manually changing the settings on the team. The sensitivity label will take precedence. We can also apply sensitivity labels to specific documents stored in that team to um, control the documents. The label assigned to the team only controls the sharing options on the documents while they stay in the team. Okay, now let me just read this again, make sure I've answered it. So, while the document remains in the team, I can't make, I can't give le more access to the document than the team settings permit, whether they're controlled by a sensitivity label or any other way. I can use the sensitivity label to further restrict access to an individual file, but I can't make it more permissive. Okay. The label assigned to the file moves with the file, whereas the settings assigned through the team label don't apply to the file if that file leaves the team. So if it's sent via email, if it's moved to a OneDrive, moved to another team. It picks up the settings of that location, whereas the label assigned to the file stays with the file. But I can't lock down the team and make the access to the document more permissive. Which I think is what you were asking. Um, okay. There's a label against the Power BI file in SharePoint, which excludes the user from opening the file to, 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 if the file is published. Oh, I might have to think about this one and come back to you because that one's quite complicated. So this label on a PBX file. So we don't label the PBX file, we label the data set. Okay. Um, and row level security will take precedence. So more restrictive row level security will take precedence over the sensitivity label. We don't apply sensitivity label. So um, they'll be able to see the report if the sensitivity label permits, but not the data that uh, if the row is more secure, is what I'm saying. But I will confirm that one. Okay. Um, 
and then the organization has one tendencies and multiple distinct sub organizations can they set their own permissions and labels independently so if it's one microsoft 365 tenant all of the labels sit in one tenant but we can use the policies to decide who to assign them to so those sub organizations that you reference there would have different uh, sensitivity label policies publishing out the different labels whether they can set up the labels will depend on whether they've got um, compliance administration access because you need that to set up the labels and all of the labels created across all of those distinct sub organizations will be in one list of sensitivity labels but we can use the policies to decide who gets which labels to to use within the organization i know that's not exactly the answer you were hoping for but we can almost get there um have i got all of the questions oh okay um Okay, so people are asking where to you, to the various different users attending, who manages your teams, who owns the management of teams. And it is mixed across different organizations. It might sit with IT, it might sit with an information governance team. Um, and actually what we're talking about does span across multiple disciplines within an organization because some of this is it some of this is information governance some of this is hr yeah so it's important that we do have that span of responsibility within there so yeah good question there thank you for for raising that interesting to see what people post in the chat in answer to that I noticed a couple of answers already in there. Yeah. Some saying IT, mainly IT. And it's a challenge for those people who've been in IT traditionally to take on board this more diverse management approach, which is why many organizations have gone with locking down the, uh, the creation of teams and requesting it through IT rather than going with the the sensitivity label and the restricted features approach it's an interesting debate you'll probably end up with all of the above okay do we have any final questions have i answered them all I think I've got most of them. I think I have, yeah. I think I can see you've got most of them, Sarah. Perfect. Well, the and thank you everyone for continuing to post their responses in there um, to mm -hmm. who manages teams. Um, just to finish off, of course, I've got to do my obligatory advert. We do run courses about all of this if you want to dive deeper into any of these. The sensitivity labels features fits into the Teams information security and also um, the um, information asset management as well. Um, if you have questions, please do feel free to get in touch. As I say, feel free to look me up on social media as well if you've got comments, queries, questions directly for me. Lovely. Thank you so much, Sarah. And we're nearly at time. That's brilliant. That's very well timed. Almost <laughs> perfectly on time. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. That, thank you, Sarah. It was so, so interesting. Um, so, yeah, behalf on of everyone here. So, uh, just to confirm, yes, uh, Iram will be in touch um, after this session with an email, but that is if you are a member of the, the legal group. If you're not, then um, I think you'll need to get in touch. Uh, with the RMS directly uh, and we can try and kind of help you as much as we can but um, we can't pull details off Livestorm so uh, everyone will be in touch with a group members who've signed up to 
to this talk. Um, but yeah, thank you so much uh, for everyone's time today. Hope you have a great rest of the day. Uh, thanks again, Sarah. So um, we'll close this event now, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.